share screen. Where are you? There we go. So we are back. Uh, and which slide was it? <laughs> Okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I was talking about this survey. So what you're seeing are six different fields. The RA deck are on the X and the Y axis. Um, and the color scheme that I'm showing is uh, corresponding to the scene distribution. So how much blurred your image gets uh, because of the presence of the atmosphere. And the median scene in our survey is about 0.6 half seconds. So the, uh, the uh, a point source will become like a disk of about 0.6 half seconds. Um, and so you can see that it's a really good quality data. And that's what you need if you want to measure these shapes uh, fairly accurately. So it helps uh, if you have survey quality data, which is as good as this. So then um, just to show you the kind of galaxies that we have to use, okay? So you are used to galaxies from JWST, which look like beautiful. And you can make out all these uh, different spiral arms and all the beautiful features. Uh, from JWST, but the galaxies that are important for us, which are useful to make a map of the dark matter itself, are these kind of galaxies, right? If I show you this thing, you will say, what, what are you doing? Are you really doing any science or not, right? But we have to measure the shapes of these galaxies, okay? And it turns out that individually, these galaxies and their shapes are not important, but when you put them together, then you can learn a lot more. Okay? So statistically, you can learn a lot more if you can combine uh, these shapes. So there's a big industry in trying to understand how to go from these noisy pixels uh, to measuring accurate uh, or getting accurate estimates of the shapes. And then from not only the shapes, but also the actual distortions which are imprinted on these galaxies. Because we are not interested in the individual shape of any of these galaxies. What we are interested in is the collective distortion that happens on the shapes of these galaxies. So let me show you uh, the kind of things that we can do, right? So um, I told you that we have uh, these different fields in Subaru HSC. So I'm just showing you four of these fields, uh, or sorry, one of the fields from these six. Um, and what is shown here are the shapes of galaxies in a particular region of the sky, okay? And uh, what you see there is a white line, which has some width and some direction, okay? So the width of the line uh, or uh, how long that line is, it tells you what is the amount of ellipticity that is present and what is its direction, okay? So the uh, size tells you what is the amount and the, uh, the direction is given by, the, uh, by how that line is slanted, okay? Is it in this direction or that direction? So what we have done is we have used many, many different galaxies and stacked their shapes together in order to figure out what this shape is, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing to know is, as I told you, we can do a computer, it's, it's like a CT scan, right? So we can do a tomographic reconstruction of dark matter. So in this upper panel, we are using galaxies which are really, really far away, very far away. From us. Then as you come closer and closer, we are using galaxies which are a little bit closer to us, a little bit closer, and then these are the closest galaxies that we have. So when we use the shapes of these galaxies, we learn about the dark matter distribution, which is in between them and us. Okay. These galaxies are very far away. So you learn about the dark matter distribution a bit further away. And as you come to closer and closer galaxies, you learn about the dark matter distribution really close to us. Okay. And so um, the dark matter distribution is shown using color here. Okay. So if you see a lot of white, then it means there's a lot of dark matter there. If you see a lot of black, then there means it means there's not much dark matter. There. Okay. And if you see something which is completely uniform, then it means, yeah, there is dark matter, but it's just uniformly distributed, right? And just by eye, you can look at this picture and tell that something interesting is going on, right? As time goes on, as you are coming closer and closer to today, you can see that structure is growing in the universe. Right? And so I don't have to show you simulations to show that structure is growing. I can look at this dark matter map made using the theory of general relativity Right? for uh, taking the shapes of these galaxies, converting them to dark matter. And you can see this growth of structure in dark matter directly from these maps. So now what we can do is take this growth in structure that we are seeing in dark matter, and we can ask what happens in the simulation 
in a dark matter simulation we can put in the initial conditions and we can let gravity take its course it will cause a growth in the large scale structure in the simulation itself the simulation will have certain parameters there will be some dark matter there there will be some dark energy there there will be a disk tug of war within the simulation that is happening and what we have to do is to match the growth of structure that we see here with the growth of structure that happening that is happening in the simulation so only when the cosmological parameters perfectly match then you can match the growth of structure if they don't match then you won't be able to match okay? so in reality we do a more complicated analysis that what than what i'm presenting here uh, there are correlations that we have to do the shape shape correlations etc uh, i won't go into the details of that right now but the rough idea is this we match the dark matter growth that we get from here to the dark matter growth that are happening in simulation and when you do that you can put constraints on cosmological parameters so here's omega matter so that pie chart you remember how much dark matter is there in the universe the matter is there in the universe that is what this omega matter quantifies okay? that's on the x axis on the y axis is a combination of two parameters sigma a which tells you what is the amount amplitude of fluctuations in the universe on a scale of 8 h inverse mega pulse okay so that's this quantity called sigma a and then another uh, omega m divided by 0.3 to some exponent okay so this is the quantity that our weak lensing observables are most sensitive to that's the reason we plot that on the y axis okay? and then what we do is you take these observations you ask which of these parameter spaces can give you the same growth of structure that you are seeing here and the answers turns out to be in this particular region okay so this red contours that you are seeing those are from the hsc year 1 data as i told you we have uh, we have 12 times more data now okay so as time goes on these error bars are expected to decrease but that's where we stand right now okay so omega matter a little bit smaller than what other experiments suggest s8 or the sigma 8 parameter which is about 0.8 or so and compared to something that you get from the cosmic microwave background it is consistent but still there is a mild kind of a tension that you see it's not exactly there maybe it's just the statistical errors are so large so we are trying to improve this statistical errors as time goes on to become smaller and smaller to see whether there is a discrepancy between what we see on the from the earliest universe what we can infer and what we infer from the observations that we do today of these galaxies of the growth of structure okay the stakes are quite high because if we see that there is a difference what it means is that there is something breaking down in the standard model of cosmology right so something is wrong between how we are extrapolating the results from the early universe to today um and you would like to know is it that dark energy is doing something strange is it changing with time we don't know but we would like to do it and one of the ways to do it is to do observations like this so is the lightest stage this month uh in this particular so, case uh yeah so uh, in this case the lighter shade is uh, two sigma this case so it's not given the errors we don't call it discrepant in this case supernova is not no so supernova uh, are distance measures and so they can never probe the fluctuations directly in in that uh, particular sense they will take for example light yeah so supernova will give you some horizontal line and we are assuming a flat universe right now so omega lambda is 1 minus omega matter but you can also try to change those assumptions and in the paper we show what happens when you do that oh yes so right yeah sorry uh, so these ds um, and kids uh, that you are seeing here the green and the uh, these particular lines they are also from lensing measurements they are kind of a competitor service but we are complementary in some respects because the dark energy survey what it does is rather than going deep it goes shallow but then wide okay so they are doing five times larger area of the sky but they are not going as deep as we go we go deep but in a smaller area and then there is kids uh, kids 450 as it's called now it's uh, about 1000 square degrees that they have also surveyed uh, they also are shallower but they do this uh, imaging in many many different bands so if you have multiple wavelength bands then you can precisely figure out where your galaxy is located okay and if you can know where the galaxy is located then the tomographic mapping is much better okay so each of these surveys are complementary to each other uh, they probe slightly different redshift ranges and so on uh, and that's what you are seeing here 
Okay. Uh, but they are contemporaneous. Okay. Um, okay. So um, all of them are seemingly suggesting a slightly smaller value of sigma. Eight. But we will see as time goes on, as we collect more and more data, the errors get uh, smaller. Then we will be able to nail down whether this discrepancy is real or not. There's another way uh, to do cosmology uh, with weak lensing and um, that particular way was something that was pioneered along with uh, Frank, for example. Right? So let me tell you how that works. Okay? So on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is the distribution of galaxies in a dark matter simulation. Okay? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, distribution of dark, uh, yeah, distribution of galaxies which are populated in a dark matter only simulation using something called a semi-analytical model. So they have some physical recipes that they put in of how gas goes into dark matter halos, how it forms stars, how they, these galaxies merge, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get a galaxy distribution. So this is showing the galaxy distribution. What you're seeing here is the underlying dark matter distribution. Okay? And what you can see is that these distributions look fairly similar, right? And that is because galaxies themselves live in dark matter halos. Wherever there is a large over density of dark matter, you expect there to be a large density of galaxies as well. Okay? So that's exactly what you're seeing here. But this correspondence is not really exact. Okay? So what you can do is you can define a quantity called delta G, which is something called an over density Q. So it tells you what is the number density of galaxies at a given location divided by the average number density of galaxies minus one. Okay? So it is telling you how many more galaxies that are there above the average. Okay? So that is what is uh, computed using this delta G. So it's the relative over density. Now this galaxy density or galaxy over density is related to the matter over density. And they are related as you can see wherever there's more than there's more, but there is this factor called the galaxy bias. Okay? So this particular factor galaxy bias plays the biggest points for Okay, And the reason behind this is as follows. You can take this galaxy distribution, you can compute something called a two point statistics, right? And what is the two point statistic? It tells you if there is a galaxy over density here, what is the probability that I will get a galaxy over density at a location which is separated by a distance r? That's what the galaxy correlation function as you measure using galaxy clustering tells you. So you can go ahead, you can map out the uh, locations where these galaxies are existing, you can take their spectra, you can figure out exactly where they are in redshift, and you can make over density maps, and you can figure out what the clustering looks like. Okay? So the clustering signal is measured as delta G, delta G, you take an average, this delta G at one position X, and this next delta G at, as a, at a position which is separated by this particular distance R. Because of the isotropy of the universe and the homogeneity, all these functions turn out to be only uh, a function of the separation itself rather than any position in this. Okay, So this quantity is called a correlation function. So you can measure this. So this quantity is related to the matter power spectrum by a factor B square. So if you go ahead, you make a galaxy clustering survey and you measure the clustering, you cannot measure the matter density power spectrum, which is related to the cosmological parameters. Instead, what you measure is this combined quantity. But now what you can do with weak lensing is you can measure not only this kind of a galaxy density map, but you can get a matter density map as the one I showed. So now instead of measuring just the galaxy-galaxy uh, -galaxy correlations, now you can measure the galaxy dark matter correlations. So when you do that, this delta G delta M now, they are uh, something called the galaxy matter cross correlation. And so now it turns out to be B times psi matter. Now, if you can combine these two, you can see that you can get rid of the bias and you can measure psi matter matter itself. The shape of this matter matter correlation function, it tells you about the cosmological parameters. How much is sigma eight? Uh, what is the, the shape tells you something about the matter density parameter as well. And so you can combine clustering and lensing in order to do this. So that's uh, something that we have done with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So this particular galaxy survey uh, is a spectroscopic survey, which means they take galaxies, they take their spectra. Because of the spectra, you know what is the position uh, in redshift space. Okay? Um, and you know the position you know, on the sky itself. You can measure these correlation functions between them. But then what we do is we use the Subaru HSC survey to measure the lensing signal for these galaxies. 
And that tells us the cross correlation between galaxies and matter. Now you can combine all these things to get the cosmological. So that is the particular program that we followed. So let me show you what the clustering signal itself looks like. Okay. Uh, so here again on the X axis is the radius. So the distance between these two galaxies on the Y axis is R times the projected correlation function. So instead of measuring in 3D, we measure a quantity, which is the projected correlation function. It's just this kind of an integral of the 3D correlation function. And so you can see these measurements here. Okay. And we have three different samples. One is called low Z, CMOS1, CMOS2, just different redshift ranges, that's all. Okay. So you take these samples and you can see the, uh, the particular shape that this follows. And remember, I've multiplied this by an R. So in reality, it is actually a decreasing function of radius, something like this. It looks roughly like a power law, WP proportional to one over R. But when you multiply by R, WP, it looks roughly like this. The signal to noise ratios that we get are about of the order 30, 35 to 40, right? Um, and so these are really well measured signals because these are done using uh, a large uh, part of the sky, about 10,000 square degrees, okay? Now what we do is we take a subsample of these which lie in the Subaru HSC region, and then we measure their weak lensing signals. So the weak lensing signals, they tell you this quantity called delta sigma, the excess surface density. The excess surface density can be calculated from the surface density itself, which is a projection like this, a similar projection to what you do in the galaxy-galaxy uh, galaxy clustering phase. Okay. So you take this, you can calculate delta sigma, and you can measure the delta sigma from observations by looking at these shapes and how, how these shapes are distorted and so on. So when we do that, this is what we get. These are the three signals. The signal to noise ratio is smaller here now because the area is only 100 square degrees. So instead of 30 uh, signal to noise ratio in the clustering region, now you have about 10. Um, and now you can combine the clustering and the lensing. We do a joint modeling of the two to then figure out the cosmological parameters. So in order to figure out the cosmological parameters, we also need to get the theory right. And getting the theory right from pen and pencil is quite difficult in this particular case. So what we do is we run lots and lots of numerical simulations. What you are seeing here are the five different parameters uh, that we consider this omega matter, omega baryon, um, and so on and so forth. There's the amplitude of density fluctuations, NS. Um, so we consider all these different parameters and we put simulations at many different locations in this parameter space, okay? And um, what this allows us is to build something called an interpolation routine which will tell us the prediction for what the clustering signal and what the lensing signal should look like at any position in the parameter space. Okay. So now you have a model, you have the observations, you keep on changing the model until you fit the observations. So how do you make this, this, this plot? Is it like, how do you make this plot? Yeah, so there are basically 100 simulations that we have drawn. And in what, yeah, n body simulations. So what is showing, uh, shown here, is the distribution in these five dimensional parameter space. So this is one parameter against the second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, and so on. And so you are seeing the distributions of how these uh, cosmological simulations are distributed. No, 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 so these are not randomly done. So this is something called a Latin hypercube uh, uh, way of putting in the simulations at uh, right locations, such that it allows for the best interpolation uh, routine that you can get out for the predictions of the mass function, the clustering of halos, and the halo matter cluster. But then the simulations, do they have the same initial conditions? Or do no, no, no. They are completely random. The simulation initial conditions are random. Um, they have to be because we are changing the uh, cosmological parameters as well. So the shape of the power spectrum changes. And so, um, so they were initialized from different places. We also have many different simulations at just one location, which is Planck. So that also allows us to uh, check for covariances and so on, and check our accuracy of the interpolation. So this yes, so these simulations are developed for this purpose, but once we have the results from these simulations, they can be used for other surveys as well. So yeah, it's, it's called a dark emulator. So uh, uh, this is publicly available now. So anyone who needs the mass function, the bias, the halo-halo clustering, the halo-matter clustering, 
you can go to this website, download a Python code, and it will allow you to do this. Of course, we were, uh, you are always limited by resolution. So you need to know when you can use it and when you can't use it. So for halos about 10 to the 13 solomas, this is perfectly fine. Okay, so I will skip this. So let me show you the cosmological constraints that we obtained from this first year of data by taking those two observables. So this is omega matter here and the S8 parameter here that you are used to now. And so you can see that we get fairly tight constraints in these two parameters. Um, and, and here it is just shown in different ways. So omega matter sigma eight and so on and so forth. Right? So the tightest parameter constraint is on this uh, parameter called S8. And you can see this value, it's about 0.8 plus minus 0.04. Now, when we do this analysis, we have to be very careful that we are not um, biased by the values that Planck has. Okay? And so in order to do this analysis, we keep ourselves completely blind from the result before we um, are sure that all of the systematics have been taken care of. So for that purpose, we run different systematic tests. So sometimes we say, we'll do some baseline analysis. Then we say, okay, we will remove one of the samples from our analysis. Let's see what happens. Uh, we'll say, we'll use different photometric redshift codes, which tell you where each of these galaxies are. So we can change each of these parameters and try to see whether there is something systematic which can move our results around. And you can see most of these things are within uh, the fluctuations uh, and the errors that are being quoted. And before we know what the actual results are, we keep this analysis blinded. So whenever we do these tests, we are not looking at these values here below, okay? So it's not like, okay, I will do all this analysis, but oh, this is my favorite model. Maybe I should just do uh, write the paper with that particular model, right? So that should not happen. And that's why we don't do it, right? We do it in a blind manner. Once we are sure that all the tests are satisfied, we are sure that there are no systematics that we can think of, then we go and unblind. And once we unblind, we found that that's, this is the result. We had decided that we'll publish no matter what comes up. Okay, so then um, um, we have done this kind of analysis uh, in different ways. So one is this Fourier cosmic shear power spectrum. So that is using the dark matter map. So that uh, particular first analysis, the, the result was this green contour here. The one that you're used to is this one in this particular parameter space. When we did the analysis with galaxy clustering and galaxy lensing, then you get these purple contours here. And just the pen and paper theory-based analysis, uh, if you can use only the large scales, then you can do that because there things are more analytical, then that's the orange uh, contour. So you can see that we uh, can do this analysis in different ways and it gives a slightly different um, uh, chunk of the parameter space or constraints on this parameter space. So in reality, if you can combine all the three together, that would be amazing, right? And that's what we are planning to do with the three-year data. We'll combine all these observables together, cosmic shear, the galaxy clustering, and galaxy-galaxy lensing, everything together to try to see whether we can um, get to a much smaller area when we combine everything. Okay. I'll skip this. Now, let me come to uh, some of the things that my students have been working on. Uh, is it okay? It's 4.30 almost, so I want to make sure that this. Yeah, there was a break in it, yeah. Okay, good. So I will, I will go quickly through this. Yeah. Uh, so these are uh, things that are being done by some of my students. After I came to Ayuka, uh, there was no weak lensing, people working on weak lensing. So it took some time for the group to get started, but they are uh, getting uh, good results now. So I let me flash some of these results. So um, the distribution of galaxies, in the, sorry, the distribution of dark matter in the universe, you can divide into the large scale structure that you have been seeing so far. But then if you go to the building block of this structure, it is the dark matter halo itself. So it's a virilized collection of dark matter particles. So that dark matter halo, if you go to a spherical cow assumption, which is always good for physicists, then it looks like this, roughly spherical. At the center of this uh, halo, there will be a big galaxy which forms, it's called a central galaxy. And around these, uh, uh, in, within this halo, which is not a central galaxy, but there can be smaller other galaxies, which also exist. These are called satellite galaxies. So this is in the dark matter picture. Um, you can see a real picture here. For example, this is a galaxy cluster, again, from the illustrious simulation. And so at the center of this halo, you see this big blob, 
big galaxy. It's a massive uh, bright cluster galaxy. And then around uh, uh, within this galaxy cluster, around the brightest cluster galaxy, there are also many, many of these smaller galaxies. Okay? So these are satellite galaxies. So what I'm going to talk about is how you can use also weak lensing in order to learn the galaxy dark matter connection. You can learn about galaxies and their dark matter halos. You can learn about galaxy groups and their dark matter halos. You can also learn about the dark matter around these satellite galaxies. Okay? So there are many, many different fun things that you can do with uh, galaxy lensing. And that's what uh, my students have been pursuing. So let me show you that. So this is the first result from Gamma Galaxy Groups. So there's another spectroscopic survey called Gamma. And they have gone ahead and found out groups of galaxies which reside together. Okay. So there are these Gamma Galaxy Groups. And some of these groups have five galaxies. Some of them have 10 galaxies. Some of them have 30 galaxies. So some of them are really bright. If you count all the luminosity within the group, some of them are faint. So what we would like to know, is there a relationship between the matter distribution, the, the baryonic matter distribution within galaxy groups and the dark matter within this galaxy? Okay. So in order to do that, we take these galaxy groups, we divide them into chunks. So some groups which have uh, a total luminosity, which is uh, written somewhere here. So 10 to the 9.4 to 10 to the 10.9 solar luminosities. So that's this particular uh, group. And then we keep on going until we reach the most massive uh, kind of galaxy groups, which are shown here. Okay? And this is the light content within this. And then we can go ahead and measure the weak lensing signal. So it's the same weak lensing signal that I talked about, the distortion of these shapes. And as you know, the distortion of these shapes becomes smaller and smaller as you go further and further. So that's what you're seeing. This is the radial distance away from the galaxy group. And you can see the measurement of the signal, this uh, delta sigma signal. You can see that it's falling down. Right? The next thing that you can notice as you go from smaller groups to bigger and bigger groups, you can see the amplitude of this lensing signal is also changing. It's becoming larger and larger. So you can use these measurements to now figure out what is the mass of the galaxy groups. And so that's what is shown here. So this is the group luminosity on the x-axis. And the y-axis is showing the average mass of these galaxy groups. So our results here are shown with bleed. There have been previous uh, computations of uh, galaxy group luminosity relations, but because of the depth of the HSC survey and the good quality data that we have, uh, we can get one of the tightest relations between the galaxy group luminosity and the group halo masses, which are there. Okay. So So this exponent is fairly close to unity for the mass luminosity relation. It's the same roughly for the mass richness relation. It's not exactly, uh, I, I can quote exact number what it is. Yes, yes, that you can get. So this is a, up to a redshift of about 0.3. Uh, no, so uh, yeah, we have not been in smaller redshift things, but each of these uh, like lower luminosity, uh, sorry, lower, yeah, lower group luminosity galaxies, because you see the fainter objects nearby, there will be some redshift uh, difference, which will be there. Huh. So that's the, that small bias is always there. And there, people try to do corrections for this because some of the galaxies you may not be able to see at the high, um, uh, like at the high uh, group luminosity and or at the higher redshifts, right? And so there are correction factors which are put in by the gamma team. Right? This is a no, no, these are spectroscopic. These are all spectroscopic. Okay. So uh, we have done the similar analysis also with uh, galaxy uh, group mass and velocity dispersion. That's another observation. Correct. Then there's another interesting thing, which is the boundaries of X-ray galaxy clusters. So this is using data from the E Rosita uh, survey. So we have a collaboration between E Rosita and HSC where we do joint projects. And so E Rosita uh, has given us locations of the clusters. And what we are trying to do is to try to find the edges of these clusters, okay? And there's a whole different talk I can give why these edges are important, but um, uh, that's something that we and Andre, we have worked extensively on. Um, but 
let me give you a short uh, upshot of this, right? And how, how it works, right? So what you can do is you can measure the cross correlation between galaxies and clusters. So you can find out how galaxies are distributed within clusters. What you realize, and what you also see in numerical simulations is that the dark matter distribution, it keeps on falling down, but then suddenly there is a sharp drop in the density distribution, okay? Around the galaxy clusters. And that particular sharp, uh, sharp drop corresponds to the location of the edge of the galaxy cluster. Okay. So these are the edges of the galaxy clusters that we are trying to find using observations. So which is pretty good because we came up with the prediction for how these edges should be um, as a function of how these, um, how quickly they are accreting mass. So if there is a galaxy cluster which is accreting mass very quickly, then this edge should be closer in. If it is accreting very slowly, then the edge should be out and so on. So that's the kind of thing that Divya Rana, one of my students is doing. Uh, so what you can see here is this galaxy distribution around the cluster. And you can see this sudden drop off that happens. Okay? And so it is the location of this drop off that he's trying to find. That's the splash back rate. Splash back rate. So that's because material which has been within the halo once, it moves out and then splashes back into the halo. So that's why it's called the splash back radius. So very cute name <laughs> that was given to it. Um, and so uh, this particular location, it uh, shows up. So this is the uh, density profile, but then you can also calculate the logarithmic derivative of the density profile. So wherever is the steepest, that's where you see, uh, that's where you see the edge. Okay? And so we can measure where this edge is and try to figure out where this edge is compared to what is the mass of this cluster. So the mass of the cluster, Again, you use weak lensing to get the mass of the cluster. So that's shown here in this particular panel, the weak lensing signal, which is again, beautiful. And you measure the mass, you measure the splashback radius. You can figure out this ratio between the edge of the dark matter halo as measured in traditional definitions and the splashback rate. So that's what is shown. R200, R200. So our result lies somewhere here, this uh, black, uh, point that you're seeing, the expectation is this dashed line. So you see, it's not too far. Um, the other X-ray results are shown here. Uh, so this is again, one of the best measurements that we get from X-ray. My student always complained, such, such bad measurements, should we really publish it? But then you see that compared to all the X-ray studies, this is the best. Uh, and that's what we want to push for. So as we go to bigger and bigger data sets, especially with ERAS, this is done with only 100 square degrees of data. With ERAS, you will have the full star. So once you have many, many galaxy clusters, you can really push this down quite a bit, okay? Um, then uh, another thing that we are doing is the uh, uh, galaxy halo, galaxy size relation. So again, you take uh, spectroscopic data samples. So this is stellar mass versus redshift. So you make bins in redshift and, uh, uh, and stellar masses such that your sample is complete. You measure the weak lensing signal. That allows you to get the relation between stellar mass and halo mass. Okay. So that um, you can get uh, from these kind of uh, delta sigma plots. So this is just shown for one of these bits, but you can get this for many, many different bits. So you can get a mass stellar mass relation, halo mass stellar mass relation. Right? And then what this postdoc has done, he has gone and ahead and measured the shapes of each of these galaxies and the sizes of each of these galaxies. So he knows what's the size of these galaxies. And that is plotted here. So it's the size of the galaxy as a function of the stellar mass. So these blue points are what shows the uh, size measurements. Okay. Now you have the size measurements as a function of stellar mass. You have the halo mass measurements as a function of stellar mass. So now you can compare how does the size of the galaxy relate to the size of the dark matter halo itself. Okay. So from long time, there has been this prediction that the size of the halo and the size of the galaxy should be well correlated with each other. So larger halos should hold larger galaxies as well. And um, it's supposed to be R, the, the radius of the galaxy should be really proportional to the R halo itself. Okay? So with an exponent of close to okay? So now with the help of weak lensing and this beautiful data from HSC, we can actually try to confront observations. With, right? So this is the halo mass stellar mass relation, but then let me show you what the size halo mass relation, sorry the size of the galaxies divided by the size of the halo as a function of stellar mass looks like. Okay, so these many, many different lines, the line that we get from our survey and from our analysis is this blue one. Okay. And if you add the, the latency and all that, 
Yeah, so yeah, so let me come 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 to them one by one. So you see these results from abundance matching. So they get the halo masses based on this technique called abundance matching. So it's not really measuring the halo masses of these objects, but figuring out what their abundance is, looking at the abundance of dark matter halos, mapping them one is one. While we are the first ones to do this analysis with weak lensing, so that we can get the masses directly from weak lensing. And so you can see that it's roughly a flat line as well. Okay. There are some deviations that we see at the low stellar mass end, at the high stellar mass end. So these are worth investigating, but it will have to be done with larger and larger data sets. Like this. Okay. So because uh, as you go to low stellar masses, the volume over which you can see these galaxies is also small. So there are a variety of other effects that come in. You have so to be sure. Is, uh, right? Yeah, master. Uh, so that will be uh, not the same as Beruzi 2018. So there are differences. I think uh, master is not plotted here. I will ask him to do it. But it's yeah. So if you want to look at the comparison between the halo masses and stellar masses, you can see it here. Right? So the blue one is ours. And the uh, rest of the things from abundance matching, etc., that you get, they are shown in these different points. So there's still some uncertainty there. Uh, yeah, and illustrious TNG is the black one. That's right. Yeah, for this one. But it is not a surprise because this was tuned to match this relation. Uh, but you look at their sizes and they look very odd. In the, in the, it's very hard to get hydrodynamical simulations to do the work. Yeah. Okay, so this was about halo size. Uh, then there are things again with uh, dark matter halo mass versus stellar mass that uh, this other student is doing, but this time using photometric galaxies, which is even harder to do. Um, but he's working on it, and so um, I, I will not. I'll just flash this slide to show that you indeed get relations where you see that higher stellar mass galaxies are living in higher mass halos, right? Um, and that there is this particular kind of relation, which has been seen also in other uh, studies, but this is the first time we are trying to use photometric data itself to, to do this. And as uh, LSST comes online, uh, this Rubin LSST survey, it is also going to give you a lot of photometric data. So we need to perfect these methods with HSC before we move on to LSST. The last result that I'm going to show is uh, a work uh, which was done uh, by this student, Amit Ratava, and he, um, also collaborated with Saradip, who uh, was an MSc student at presidency. Um, and so what you're seeing here is the weak lensing signal of subhalos within galaxy clusters. So you take galaxy clusters, which are many, many of these galaxy satellite galaxies. You look around the weak lensing signal around these satellite galaxies. So that tells you what is the dark matter distribution around the satellite galaxies themselves. As these satellite galaxies orbit the halo of the cluster, you see that matter is being stripped away from the subhalos themselves. Okay. And so this allows us, by looking directly at the weak lensing signal, it allows us to figure out what this dark matter distribution looks like. Okay. And what we did is we compared the dark matter distribution around the satellite galaxies to the dark matter distribution around field galaxies in the universe, which are not sitting in clusters. So then you can see a differential effect. What is the difference between the halo masses of galaxies which are completely in the field compared to galaxies which are within the clusters to see how the dark matter is getting affected by this environment. Okay. So what you're seeing here in the green line are the signal around these satellite galaxies in clusters. And the red line or the red points that you see here is the signal around the galaxies which are in the field themselves. And they are cross match to have the same baryonic properties, okay? So that uh, there is no bias that gets introduced because of that. And you can see that as you go to the cluster center, so this is 100 to 300 kiloparsecs from the center of the cluster, you can see the red points are systematically above the green points. And so what it means is that the field galaxies, they have a much higher mass uh, compared to the satellite galaxies which are within the cluster. Now the question is how much higher? And so for that, you again do the analysis. To do the modeling, and here is what you get out. Uh, so this is the mass distribution of the subhalo masses around the cluster satellites. So this is the green one, and then this is the same galaxy, similar kind of galaxies, but in the field. So you can see they are separated quite a bit, right? And uh, the the difference between the two 
is roughly a factor of about 1.5 years. So there is a difference that you get between the halo masses uh, as you go closer and closer to the cluster. And then um, based on the study that we did with Saradeep as well, we tried to turn this relationship around, right? So this difference that we see in the halo masses, we asked, could some of these galaxies that are there, the satellite galaxies that are there, could they have completely lost their halos, right? So maybe there is a fraction of galaxies which have completely lost their halos, and then a fraction of galaxies which don't lose any dark matter mass at all. Reality is somewhere in between. But if you use this kind of a small toy model, then you can put an upper limit on what is the fraction of galaxies which have completely lost their dark matter. Okay. So these kind of galaxies are called orphan galaxies. And so what you're seeing are the first limits that we have put on the orphan fraction as a function of radius. So as you go from away from the cluster center, you can see that this orphan fraction uh, limits, they drop off. Okay. So as you go further and further away, the fraction of galaxies which should have completely lost their halos must be as small as this, right? It must be very small. And as you come closer and closer, it can grow as high as 40%, but not more than that. If it is more, then you would have been in trouble. Okay. Now, this is again important because in galaxy formation simulations and so on, they try to invoke these kind of orphan galaxies because their simulations cannot resolve all the subjects. There's something again, Frank has worked extensively on that simulations cannot resolve uh, how these dark matter subhalos are getting skipped. And some of them, they just lose them even before they should be lost. Okay. So by nearby, I mean, this is the distance away from the cluster center. Yeah, yeah. Because if that is the case, then you would have seen an even larger difference in the weak lensing signals around the satellites and the, uh, around the field type. The fact that you only see this much, it puts a limit. If you had 100% of them lost, everything was lost, then you would have seen almost a zero signal for the uh, around the satellites, while around the uh, field galaxies, you would have seen a finite signal. But we don't see that, and that puts a limit. So that's that thing. And we have tried to compare uh, like different things like universe machine, as it's called from Beruzi, uh, as to where it lies. And it's getting close. And so it can be uncomfortable for some of these models, which is great. And now we can, from observations, try to put constraints on this, on this quantity. Okay, since I'm running too late, I think I'll skip this thing about primordial black holes using abundance. And uh, I'll just come to this last slide, which shows the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, so this is a project that I'm heavily involved in, especially uh, from India. I started uh, the bigger Rubin India collaboration here, uh, which is a, um, a joint uh, collaboration between different institutes. Uh, so TIFR, IIA, Ayuka, ICER, Pune, um, IIT Indore, uh, and NCRA. These are the institutes which are involved. Uh, so this particular telescope, which will it will be great because the field of view that it has is 10 square degrees compared to the 1.75 square degrees on HSC. So it is a much bigger machine. It can do a survey of the entire observable sky from Chile within a week, right? And so it will continue to take the data, take data of the first week, the second week, third week, will continue for 10 years. So instead of getting just an image of the star, you'll get a time-lapse movie of the star, right? Which will be just amazing because it can do so many things for galaxies, uh, for cosmology, for understanding uh, transients and variables, for understanding the solar system itself. I've not talked about uh, one of my pet projects, which is to try to find a new planet in the solar system. So even for that, right? So it's just amazing. Once you have the technology, you can do so many uh, great things with it and learn about the universe. So let me end with this summary slide. Uh, I've told you about the cosmological constraints from the Subaru Hypersuprime Camp Survey. I talked about cosmic shear, how you can make dark matter maps and how you can use it to see the growth of large scale structure and put constraints on the cosmological parameters. And then I also showed you some, some sets of interesting astrophysical results. So I talked about the galaxy group halo connection. I told you how you can use the weak lensing signal to get the galaxy size, halo size connection. And then I also talked about the halos of satellite galaxy. So there are many interesting things that are going on. Uh, um, and so just you're welcome to come and talk to me or ask any questions that you may have about this.
Thank you. Fantastic, Sohud. Except the technical glitches, I think are absolutely wrong. The time for questions is there. Yes, Manik, please. Thank you. Sure. Oh, okay. So, my question is that by using the strong arrangements in brackets, is it possible that we could just carry out the primary brackets in which we switch? Or we could just switch into the primary brackets by using the strong gravitational waves? Strong gravitational waves into primordial gravitational waves. No, I have not heard about that. But one thing. No, I mean, you can look for primordial gravitational waves and you can try to uh, clean up the polarization map by using uh, the information from gravitational lensing. But I don't think it's from strong gravitational lensing. Because strong gravitational lensing is only relevant in a very small angular area. While these primordial gravitational waves, they are um, of angular scales which correspond to L of 100. So that is much bigger on the sky. Strong gravitational lensing will be in a very small area. Um, can use you can use gravitational lensing to do some foreground cleaning. Yes. Or the primordial uh, gravitational wave background. Yes. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Mutra. Thank you sir, for the great talk. So, I can say that you talked a lot about this ASI to reach and sigma H parameters. I just did not understand like, what is it important? Like, why is it so important? Yeah, yes. So just before you answer the question, I think the thing is, so I should say this through your talk. So, some we, we always used to we mostly have colloquia where the classes were exceeding the research talks, the colloquia talks. In this case, the growth history of the universe was supposed to be covered oh. after the uh, semester break. So, okay, no problem. No, no, I, I, I can explain. No, no, no problem. So, um, so if you look at the dark matter distribution in the universe itself, right, it's clumpy, right? And what you would like to know is how clumpy it was in the initial uh, density fluctuation field, right? But of course, it's harder to measure the initial density fluctuation. So you come to today, what you do is you take the initial density fluctuations in the very early universe, you let them grow via linear perturbation theory. Then you see them today. Okay. So that uh, those density fluctuations, now you can smooth them over a length scale of about 8 H inverse megaparsec. So what you go is you go to a point, you draw a sphere around that point, and you measure what is the average over density with, around that point in an 8 H inverse megaparsec sphere. Then you go to another place, you do the same. You go to another place, you do the same. Now what you will get is what is this average over density smooth over that 8 H inverse megaparsec uh, uh, sphere, right? And you can uh, make a histogram of these quantities. So it looks roughly like a Gaussian. It will have a mean of zero because the average density over density of the universe has to be zero. Right? And so it has a mean of zero and it has some width. That width, that sigma of that Gaussian is sigma. If you had uh, 16 H inverse megaparsec, it would be sigma 16, right? So depending upon how much you smooth out, uh, it tells you what is this scale. Now, why is it important? Because it tells us how big these initial density fluctuations were. So if these fluctuations are higher, then you expect more structure to be seen today. If they are lower, then you expect lower structure. But it is the initial conditions of the universe, right? You would like to know where we came from. That's the reason why it is important. Right? So it tells you how clumpy the universe initially itself is. So in tomorrow's evening, Thursday's class, uh, are sitting there. Yeah. We are going to start linear perturbation. Okay. So as I said, the talk was ahead of the talk. I should have come later. Yeah. Okay. Very nice talk. Thank you. So I have uh, two questions. Yeah. One from the uh, strong lensing part. Sure. So you, you mentioned that if we are looking at so this the lens uh, objects uh, will appear uh, as a different objects in a catalog. So I was just wondering if I'm just looking at the catalog, SPSS catalog, for instance. So how how do we get to know if there is any existence of 
like strong like these four objects are the same object yeah are you matching the black hole mass or <laughs> No, it's very difficult to match the black hole masses, right? Because imaging will only tell you the magnitudes of these objects. And so it is very hard. What, um, I mean, you, you need to have a prepare here for this particular thing. But what, uh, what you have to do is you have to really go ahead and search for these objects. Um, and these objects are like needles in a haystack. So majority of the objects will not be strong gravitationally. Okay? Most of them will be just as they are, but they will be weakly lens. So their shapes will be slightly different from what they are supposed to be, but uh, they will not be strongly lensed. Strong lensing only happens in a very rare case where the alignment is super perfect, right? Between the lens and the sources, okay? Mm -hmm. So majority of your objects will not be lensed. Now the question is, how do you find the lens? Yeah. So for that, there are different kinds of searches that you have to do. So it depends upon what your goal is, right? So let's suppose your goal is to find quasars which are multiply lens. Then uh, you have to ask, okay, what kind of quasars do I want to look at, right? Are these, um, because most of the lens systems, they will have very small image separation, which means the quasars that are there, the multiply image quasars, they will also not that be that far away from the galaxy. So then it becomes harder to identify. But then the, the kind of quasars that you saw in this picture, they are very, very well separated. So what you can do is you can go to the catalog, you can try to look for all quasar-like objects, and you can try to find uh, quasar-like objects, multiple quasar-like objects, which have the same color around the galaxy cluster. Okay, Because quasars are so rare, you don't expect them all to be within a certain distance of the galaxy cluster. Right? And so then you see, and then you ask, okay, I found these systems. Now, again, that does not confirm lensing. Yeah. Then you go ahead, you model the system, you ask, are the locations of these positions of these quasars, is it consistent with being gravitationally lensed? So can I explain it with one position, but then light coming from different ways to explain the locations of these four? If yes, then still you're not 100% sure. It's still a candidate. Then you go ahead and you take the spectra of, that, of those objects. You take the spectra, you see that yes, indeed, this spectra also look exactly the same. Then you're sure that it's a gravitationally lensed quasar system. If you're looking for lensed galaxies, then typically you will find arcs around these uh, galaxy clusters, uh, or even around uh, single galaxies, you can find arcs. So for that, you have to write arc detection algorithm. Okay, and um, so again, Anuprita is someone who has worked on this extensively. Um, and computer algorithms are okay, but they are not always great. So one of the things that we have also done <laughs> is to ask citizen scientists to take a look at these images. Okay, so we just put all these images that we had available, put it on the internet, ask anyone to classify these images. Now, of course, you will say, why do you rely on the citizen scientists, right? They know nothing about astrophysics. True. What we do is we do another clever thing. We also rate what these citizen scientists are capable of. Okay, so we have put in simulated images of lens systems, and then we see how they perform in the simulated images without telling them that they are looking at a simulated image. Then we can understand this guy, he always marks a lens galaxy as a lens galaxy and an unless galaxy as an unless galaxy. Then his classification is useful. Maybe there's another guy who does exactly the opposite. If he sees a lens, he sees it's not a lens. If he sees not a lens, he sees it's a lens. But that is also perfect information because it tells you exactly which the lenses are. So even if they have marked it opposite, we can use this information to actually find these systems as well. So then you take these systems, then you put it through machine learning algorithm. Lots of, there's lots of research going on in order to find these systems. And um, uh, Anuprita she, uh, is leading this strong lensing working group and she has been uh, in HSC and she, she has found like many, many such systems uh, using these kind of algorithms, like uh, hundred, hundreds of them. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> my answer was too long. <laughs> Yes. 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 Yes.
No, no, it won't be exactly just like one bend, of course, but there will be multiple deflections that will happen. So overall, it will be the deflection from the distribution itself. But this is just a cartoon picture, of course. In reality, light will take like a lot of zigzag paths. Zigzag path. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, sure. Any other questions? How many times have you done Yes, yes, galaxy morphology. Well, uh, I mean, at that point, they were not taking the skill of this person into account. We were the first, uh, so we are also part of the same organization called Zooniverse. Um, they ran the Galaxy Zoo project initially. And then we came in with the Bayesian framework to take the classifications of the users on simulated objects and to make sure that we understand their skills and use these skills to then propagate um, into the real classification. Because the problem with morphological classification, you go to uh, like old people who have done it with their own eyes, right? They will say, why are you relying on these people, right? And now what I can tell him is that you, Tell me what is your classification scheme. I can map whatever these people have done onto your classification scheme, right? So if you have mapped a certain set of galaxies, you know perfectly what their scores are. You give me, and there is a transformation matrix that I can take from these users' classification, convert it to your own classification that will be as good as yours, right? So this was done for the first time from our project. Now they have used it extensively. Uh, so the project uh, that we ran is called Space Wars. Um, and that framework uh, was developed in one of those papers. Yeah, so my question was that, uh, so what is the scenario between machine learning and this uh, lens pointing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So again, Anuprita works on this quite a bit. So uh, have you have to yeah. get her, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Since there are many strong lens related questions. So um, uh, there is there's a lot going on actually. And uh, people use these convolution neural networks and deep uh, uh, learning in order to um, basically take images of galaxies, you simulate lensing, and then you uh, go ahead, you feed it to a network telling that this is a lens, this is not a lens. Then you go to uh, your real survey, you pass on the images and then try to find. So there are at least two to three papers that I know of which are using machine learning in order in the in the context of finding gravitational lenses. So they are also massively successful. Yeah. So machines are taking over, of course. So uh, I have one another question. So in the cosmic shear, uh, yeah. so I did not understand how I'm predicting the dark matter from the elongation and the direction of the galaxy. Yeah, so uh, sorry. So the mass distribution is that, right? The governing equation is basically this, okay? okay? So there is a more complicated equation which takes you from the shear to directly the map, map okay? It's a deconvolution operation, et cetera. I can show you what those equations look like. But fundamentally what it is, is this kind of equation. So you look at the tangential shear of these objects. So how, how much they are elongated with respect to the, one of these centers, right? And then that is related to the surface density averaged within that radius, okay, so everywhere here, and then the surface density at that location. So the difference of these two is related to this tangential shear. So now if you have a model, say a dark matter halo with a certain mass, then you can predict what this tangential shear signal should look like. So it's pattern matching after that. Okay. So it's basically pattern matching after that. Then you get the mat matter distribution. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. In reality, of course, we do much more complicated things. Each of these shapes, we have to cross correlate and uh, E modes, B modes, etc. So, okay. any other questions? Yes, Mr. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One related to my first question, the other related to the second question. One, so when this, uh, in the late 2000s, when the uh, SZ surveys are going on, ACT, STT, so they say that. Uh, Sigma 8 is uh, what they measured was lower than what they expected from CIM. So is that a thing then that uh, from 
large scale structure kind of simulation as uh, observations you get in lower sigma intensity yes so if you combine all of these surveys together then you start to see that there is not five sigma yet but there is uh, uh, if you look at all these surveys they tend to give a lower value of sigma okay now what we want is we want to make sure that we hone each other like hone all these different methods to have statistical errors which are so small that you are like definitely sure that this is real okay we are not there yet but in a few years i think we will be and um, rubin will be perfect in that because it will do something like 20000 square degrees and we are right now in the realm of only 1000 square degrees. but it's not easy because there are tons of systematics when you come here right um, you don't know exactly where the red shifts are you need to infer them um, so there are different techniques to do that as well you maybe the templates that you are using they may not be exactly right and so that can cause some small differences in the red shift inferences and all of these things will start mattering once we come to uh, something like the lssd whose statistical power is so large that you have to worry about all these systems the other so so it will so it's just it will take some some more time and some more effort but, but. And the other question i had was uh, so on one hand as you explained uh, that you are using uh, weak lensing to uh, sort of infer cosmological parameters mm -hmm. and then towards the end you showed that you are using weak lensing to say uh, trace things like edges of clusters which is essentially uh, part Very of the, uh, the the gravitational potential of the lens yes so isn't there a degeneracy between these two things uh yes so um in principle if you look at the large scale clustering of the universe the reason why the galaxies are clustered is because they live in dark matter halo right and so they inherit the dark matter halo bias uh with them now if you can measure the masses of these objects perfectly well then there is also a relationship between the mass of these objects and the bias of this object so everything can come together if you can use all the small scale information and the large scale information okay so you can get much better constraint if you even go to further smaller scale but we restrict ourselves only to large scale because there are other kind of uncertainties that we have to start to worry about so there is this thing called assembly bias uh, which can start to play a role and that complicates the relation between the bias of halos and their masses um, and so on so um ideally we would like to merge everything together and uh, do all of the galaxy halo connection and the cosmology all together um one of the results about clustering and lensing that i showed uh, we are go going to scales where this is important and so we do model the galaxy halo connection plus the cosmology as well but we still don't go to really small scale because we fear baryonic effects may start to play a role there may be some other assembly bias related things which are playing a role so that's the only reason why we don't push too much but independently like if you are not concerned with cosmology you can still go to the small scales figure out what the halo masses are don't relate it to the bias that's all no both of these are complementary so uh, in the end what you want is a large area and a deeper <laughs> surface and that's what lssc is going to do and so right now we are the precursor survey to lssc but in a smaller area and now with lssc it will be similar depth even slightly more deeper but like 20000 square degrees so because you want to do tomography so that's why you need to go deep and if you uh, go wider then you get a larger area of the sky so many many more galaxies many many more large scale modes and so ideally you want deeper and wider and, <laughs> and that's what you will get with the system you are comparing they are far yes does it have any effect on your of course system? yeah yeah so um, once we do the simulations we measure all these statistics with it um then we have to interpolate right and every interpolation routine will have some error and so what we have to do is we reserve a test set of simulations 
which we don't use to create the interpolation scheme. And then we ask how good is the prediction compared to the real exact value at that location. Right? And so we see up to two to three percent differences in the clustering signal and the lensing uh, uh, or the galaxy matter cross correlation and the halo halo cross uh, correlation. Um, and so what we have to do is take these errors and make sure that these errors are smaller than the statistical error that you are going to get at the end. And if it is not enough, then you have to run even more like densely populated it even further. And of course, 100 is uh, in a five dimensional parameter space is nothing, right? Um, and so um, you have to be careful about these things and uh, you have to be able to propagate uh, these answers. So you have to do it. There's nothing. Uh, any other questions? Questions from the audience? <laughs> if not, I think I have two questions, but in one of them I forgot. <laughs> Sorry. So the first one I think is again related to the sigma thing. Ah. So consistently, yeah. we see that large scale structure predictions of sigma and the CMD predictions. So when you talk about CMD predictions, you have to be careful because one you get from the primary and isotropism the CMD, but even when you have cluster surveys like in the plant or when I was mentioned, mentioned in SPT and in CT, that is essentially you are looking at clusters and you are uh, looking at their you know, mass functions and stuff like that. So that's essentially large scale structure. I should not call it uh, CMD constraint, oh. not the CMD power spectrum versus essentially looking at clusters and distribution of clusters. So if I remember correctly, the long constraints on sigma H from the primary power spectrum and the clusters, that was, uh, was it, did that have the same tension or was it that? Yeah, so no, no, no. So th there is, uh, 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 there is a, there is evidence for seeing differences in sigma yes. H. And in the same direction that we see that sigma it is lower when you cons consider probes which are at lower redshifts or more local probes right, of large scale structure and of, of this structure. Now, the problem there is always that there are systematic uncertainties, right? So one of the biggest systematic uncertainties there in, the, uh, in using the clusters uh, and their abundances is how do you identify the relation between the observable of this cluster, which is say the SZ significance, right and the halo mass, okay? And for that, again, you have to do weak lensing surveys. You go and you measure the masses. Now there are three different surveys which have done this calibration. Each of them gets slightly different answers. Yes. And so depending upon which one you trust, the sigma tension becomes yes. lower yes. or higher or even larger and so on. So, and so, so is it fair to say that if this tension exists between the, because it has been there for like what, 20 years, I mean, 20, 20 or at least 10, 15 years, you can yeah. think of like the of constraints. So is it fair to say that the tension that we see from the structure and CMD has more to do with the mass observable calibrations? Well, um, and is it possible so, that- So yes. this is the reason why we want to do cosmic shear, right? Yes. Because there we are not relying on any of these uh, relations between the directly objects we are directly measuring the dark matter yes. and that's the best way right and that's the reason why people just uh, go to cosmic shear but it has other systematics right so yes. i think we have to be modest and we have to think that okay we will do our best there will be on the cluster side that people will do yeah, uh, then there will be supernovae which will be doing something else and all of these things concordantly have to give the same answer if so, it is so what is so cc of from the center. What is the current status? So, for example, if I look at uh, you know mass of the level relations from like optical richness, XZ signal, X-ray, which is the tightest X-ray, and then you get sigma H from all these surveys, and then you compare with what you get by picking up CMB bar spectrum. What is the standard typical tension? Yours was two sigma. That's not a tension. That's not. Yeah, that's why I said we are consistent right now. But then, and um, so. The you can get tensions of the order of two to three sigma, three and a half yes. to four sigma at all, but not more than that. Yeah. And um, is, I think, much more and it, but it typically also depends upon whether systematic uncertainties have been added to it or not. 
If you add the systematic uncertainties, then again it will become of the same order. So then the question is that is, is it real or not? <laughs> yeah, the question is that can we think of any physical scenario where we can expect it to be different? For example, the Hubble telescope. Yeah. I mean, people are talking about different models of dark energy. Yeah. So the SIT tension, SIT is actually less than sigma. Mm -hmm. Sigma tension is more. So if the sigma tension, let's say we are thinking that it's observational bias or our calibration of mass, etc. Et Could there be any physical reason why should they be different? Like people try to think about yeah. different models of dark energy to talk about the yeah. tension. No, so so dark energy, if you change the equation of state. Uh, then it does affect the yes, the, the value of SA, right? Because uh, after all, it is an extrapolation from, from the CMB observations yes, to today right. using a model. So that's if you right. now tweak the model, right. then you can change the sigma. That's so that right. is not a problem. I think right now, the, what people try to do is trying to solve both the Hubble tension and the sigma uh, right. related issues yes. with the same model. And yes. if you can do that, then it's yeah, better think, because it's less uh, you are adding less things right so so the student that i was talking about if you go to this track poster this is in satellite kinematics yeah to, to multiply talk about the essay the sigma tension and the hubble tension yeah so i heard from one of his talks a couple of years back so uh -huh. yeah i mean hubble tension i can see that physically this could be possible but sigma well, no, but you could break the model, right? So yeah, it is growth of structures. Growth of structures and CMB is just low fluctuations. So maybe it's just the extrapolation. It's the extrapolation, likely. Um, I mean, that's where it might fall at the end. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, you have one more. Okay, last one. Sir, uh, actually, in the first slide where you explain the uh, the first slide where you showed the observation by the telescope, the sugar. Telescope. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, distortions in the RNA uh, things. So, could you just uh, get that first? In the first slide, where you showed the observations. Last or first? Uh, no, it's like you talking about the seeing. Seeing. Ah, the seeing plot. I see. Uh, on the second slide of the telescope, probably. The first slide, yeah, yeah, yeah. where you showed the telescope. Yeah, uh, just after this. Yeah. Uh, these uh, tiny circular like distortions uh, on the sixth and the first are. are yeah. Yeah. So you know when you observe the uh, sky, ideally you only want to see galaxies, right? But uh, there are these pesky things like stars, uh, which also um, are there, right? And so what happens is when you have a telescope like Subaru, which is which is eight meter class telescope, if you put in a bright star um, in, within its field of view, sometimes even outside its field of view, the light from this star it just completely saturates the uh, detector. So uh, if you have taken a picture of the sun with your cell phone camera or something, you start to see, notice bleeding. Right? And it's the same kind of thing that happens. And so all this area around the bright star becomes unusable. And so we have to just remove it out uh, from our analysis. Okay. So there are many, many these small holes that you are seeing. They are because of stars, which are bright enough to saturate our CCD. And so all the pixels which are near this stuff, we have to throw them. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> yes. This is called one night. No, no, no. On the field of this is over uh, uh, like hundred nights, I think. So how can you calculate it in the scene depending on which direction you are looking? Yes, yes, yes. Which target that you are seeing. No, so what we are doing is uh, what you are seeing plotted here is when you are looking at one particular direction, uh, there won't be one image which was taken uh, for looking at that direction. It will be tiled with multiple, roughly six to uh, seven exposures are taken in every direction. And so what you do is after that, you co-add the images. And when you do the co-addition, then on the co-add, you can ask, what is the size of the stars on the co-add? And so what you are seeing is basically the size of the stars on the co-add. And what that distribution looks like. And it's not a single. Smaller, smaller than the scene, actual scene. Um, no, not really. I mean, uh, the co addition is still like the smearing will still be there, right? I mean, co addition is not going to get rid of smear. Like if you stack even 1000 images, it's not going to give you a delta function <laughs> for a star. And so this smearing still remains. It's the average smearing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Okay, thank you so much. And we are supposed to meet next week, so I have to confirm that the speaker is talking. I'm not announcing now because I haven't bought the title and abstract yet. But once we get it, we'll share with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So the, 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 so I, I just